What's up guys? My name is Justin and thank you for tuning in to Thriving Coach Podcast. And I'm Zane. What we try to do here is help navigate men through their relationships as they go through their work-life balance with not only their spouse, but also their kids. Seeing it from two different point of views, Justin with the three kids and me starting fresh, just now about to get married. Just like Zane said, we're here for you and we hope you enjoy this episode. Hey guys, so we have a really cool special guest today. Um, his name is Justin Holland. Uh, he's not only a entrepreneur, he's not only a, a father, he's also someone that represents a lot of people here from Texas with being a state representative. Uh, we really enjoy that you've set, your, set some time away uh, to be able to actually come out and talk to us uh, as we, me and him both kind of venture through what we call, you know, no race like home right. um, and how you kind of balance that thing. So uh, do you have anything that you want to go ahead and add to that? No, I appreciate you, Justin, taking time and meeting with us today. Um, not only are we, I, I consider you a good friend, but also one of the mentors in my life as I've grown up and become a father and a husband. So I know you and your wife have always been there for me. So I wanted to get you on the show and uh, let you kind of take the floor and help people like me and Zane and others that we're constantly reaching out to to see what uh, tips and tricks you got or I mean anyone who has the experience you have has to have knowledge and wisdom through either well whether it's through the scars they've taken on the way and so we thought um, there's no one else uh, better than in my inner circle to have on the show so thank you. Well I appreciate it and I definitely don't get everything right and haven't gotten it right, but I do have, you know, a little bit more runway out there uh, and happy to talk about um, whatever you guys want to talk about today. Let's just make men better. Yeah, no, that's exactly, that's the whole purpose behind this podcast is to help men uh, find their purpose as fathers and husbands and hopefully keep them from making some of the mistakes we made. Sure. But. And I see it really cool from my side because, you know, where you're at and even where Justin's at, I, I haven't quite made it there yet. I'm about to get married mm -hmm. uh, this year and I don't even have any kids. So it's pretty cool to be able to see that I got to have, you know, a mentor and Justin and then also going to be able to bounce ideas that sure. I may have and see what you think's different um, up on it. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the first ones, I mean, now that you are a husband and how, how did, so how'd you meet your wife? Neely and I met at Texas Tech University. Um, she grew up in Amarillo and I grew up here in Rockwall Heath area. And uh, I went out to Texas Tech, uh, joined a fraternity, got in the communications and public affairs uh, route in school. Um, obviously being in the real estate business and being in politics, communications and public affairs, I'm actually one of the few people that actually uses their college degree that uh, that I talk to or that I'm with. Um, but we met then in class um, and we actually got there at the same time uh, in year 2002 and we went a full three and a half years, never met each other. Uh, and then in our senior year of classes, uh, she was in about three of my classes and so, um, we were sitting, you know, across the room, and then, you know, every day that went by, we we kind of moved towards each other. So it was really a she. She tells people that she chased me, but I I was just scared to death of her because she was so beautiful. But um, <laughs> we we had a uh, we we had a really really good story. Just just learn, meeting each other and learning about each other and uh, and and starting to date uh, in about 2005 in May. Okay. Yeah. When do you have anything that you kind of looked for when it came to picking your wife that maybe she brought to the table where you were like, okay, I really like that. Or was it just kind of just a mutual, just surprise? Well, she was really hot. Um, <laughs> that, that helped. Uh, she, uh, she's a beautiful lady. Uh, but all kidding aside, we just enjoyed talking to each other and conversing with each other. And like, we really became best friends. And, uh, in fact, I mean, there was a time probably for six months or so where she went to Spain and I went to Washington, D.C., and we weren't even really dating. We were just best friends. And, you know, I obviously wanted that to go, uh, you know, the other way, and it ended up doing that. But, um, you know, we spent six months uh, talking to each other from Washington, D.C. To, to Spain on the phone just as friends. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow. Um, and then you fast forward a little bit. Y'all met. And then I, you have two kids now? We've got two little girls, Wiley Beth and Cully. They're uh, uh, about to turn 10 and 12. So Wiley Beth will be 12 and Cully will be 10. And they are um, both this month in February. 
I assume this will be on in, air in February, but maybe, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th this month, they're, th they turn uh, 10 and 12 in February. Yeah, okay. I've seen them grow up. It's been, mm -hmm. it's been awesome. They're so, great kids. Uh, how would you say your career goals have changed since becoming a father? Before you have kids, that's a great question because before you have kids, um, we all are inherently selfish. But um, I would say that you know my goals, career goals, were much more singularly focused on how do I become the most successful in the quickest amount of time. Personally, you know whether that be success in making money or salary or growing, uh, you know our company. And then as you get kids, you start to look at things from a different angle, different lens that makes you really want to leave a legacy behind for them, whether they want to be a part of this company like you are and your dad's um, and working with your dad. Um, you know, my dad was uh, uh, the founder of this company in 1991, and I ended up coming back and doing the same thing he did. And Leighton and I would love for our, uh, that's my business partner, to have our kids work in this company one day if they want to carry it, carry on the regal name sometime. But I would say the answer is you, you look at life and success and business from a different angle because you want to do that for them rather than for yourself. Like I would, I would almost say that it completely changes, you know, yes, of course I'm driven and I want to be successful, but you know, uh, there are times when, you know, you just got to trust in God that, you know, he's taking care of you. God's got it. He tells us that in the Bible. And um, if I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing, he's going to take care of my family. He's not going to, he, he tells us not to worry about what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear. Yeah. And I, got, I constantly have to remember that because if you're an entrepreneur, sometimes you don't get paid every two weeks, you know, yeah. sometimes you get paid every two or three months Yeah. Uh, in our case, in the real estate business. And that's, you know, you kind of, pinpointed something that I really focused in you, you kind of said before you had kids you're selfish mm -hmm. and I tell people that all the time so I don't like I said I don't have any kids and people ask me oh when are you gonna have kids and I always say oh I'm too selfish right now to have kids I have too much aspirations that I want to do with my life that I don't see a way to have kids when you look back at that was it kind of a planned when having kids or you know we, we really didn't plan it uh, it worked out really well for us Neely and I dated from 2005 to 2008 so we dated three years and then 2008 to 2012 we were married for four years um, I do think that there's some value uh, if you can plan it and God plans everything for you but um, we thought ours just worked out really good I mean I was 28 when we had Wiley Beth I was 30 when we had Cully and uh, the timing for us worked out really good, but sometimes, you know, you don't get to pick that. Sometimes people can't even have a child. Um, and sometimes they have one really young. And so, um, I would, I, I would say that not, not to focus on the timing as much as solidifying your relationship with your spouse, because that's, what's got to work. And Neely and I, uh, talk all the time that, uh, Whenever the kids move out, which is not that long, you know, I know it it's, doesn't seem like it, but Wiley Beth is going to be 12, so she goes to college in six years, yeah. and Cully goes to college in eight years. I mean, that's that's not that long. Don't and, remind me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because Kenzie's the same age. <laughs> but you you have to like that person when your kids leave, and so many people get that wrong. And so you know, working on putting in the work with you and your wife early your fiance, your wife early, uh, to make sure that you, you actively, uh, still enjoy each other's company because the kids are gone. And then sometimes people look up and say, I don't even know this person that I'm, you know, married, married to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really appreciate that advice. And that's something that me and my fiance are currently trying to strive for because we're changing the, the woman you married is not the same woman that you're with today. No. <laughs> and that's what that's what I'm trying to figure out with me and my fiance at this point. And I'm sure Justin, you can kind of piggyback on that. Yeah. With, uh, Kimber is not the same person that you were with what, four years ago, five yeah, years five ago. Five years ago? No, not at all. Yeah. She's uh she's completely different, and so am I. I mean, she was actually three years. She's three years older than me, so she had to watch me mature very quickly, yeah. especially with the six year old sure. and me coming home from California playing a sport for my job. So right. I was definitely not mature enough to take on that role. And uh, there, was def there was for sure people in my life that agreed with me and thought maybe I was uh, trying to advance too fast. But I just, I've always wanted to be a dad, and it, this, it fell in my lap. And I have uh, big aspirations of being a father and a husband at a younger age than most of my friends did. They all thought I was crazy. Sure. So, But I just, 
I always knew it was a good a purpose of mine is to be a father. So, uh, I mean, to kind of piggyback off that, as far as we we both have 11 year olds, and not, and you have a nine year old. What do you do about the screen time situation with cell phones and tablets? Because yeah. us growing up, we didn't have that issue. We had a PlayStation, but not. So we utilize the tools uh, pretty well um, that parents, you know, the parental controls. Wiley Beth has a phone. Uh, we found that to be a good tool to know where she's at and her be able to get a hold of us. But she doesn't have any social media. Uh, she doesn't get to, uh, I, mean, I mean, we're very restrictive about what she gets. I mean, I don't even think she has like a Pinterest or anything like that. She is interested in, in videoing and stuff. So I think she has like a, like a cap cut or something like that where she can make her own funny videos with her friends and her little sister wants that too. But we are pretty restrictive. I, I have to get a notification on my phone every time she wants something and half the time it's deny, 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 <laughs> um, uh, or, or whatever. Yeah. Disapprove or deny, but very, very few times will I, you know, let her have something. It, it's very dangerous because somebody told me this and I, I'm not going to plagiarize it because I, I don't know who it was, but somebody said the day uh, that you want your kids to grow up, give them social media. And uh, that really, really stuck with me because, you know, there's so many things out there that are damaging to kids. Uh, we do a lot of work with that in my job in Austin about just trying to make sure we're protecting our kids because that's the most important thing to do. I mean, and so I think they can wait. I think we've gotten into this thing where parents just want their kids to be cool and be, have the same stuff as their friends and everything. And I'm just haven't fallen into that. Uh, we tell our kids no a lot. And uh, you know, you're lucky you have a phone. And um, so she, you know, she can call her friends and text her friends on group chats. And um, there's a Facebook kids messenger thing that we get and we see everything that happens. We try to monitor, uh, you know, what's going on, but also you got to let them grow up and be, you know, adults too. At some point, it's just not time for that yet. So, um, Wiley Beth, um, plugs her phone in, in our room every night. She doesn't go upstairs. She doesn't get it. And, uh, and I'll take it away from her. You know, like if she does, so, she does something that is, you know, disrespectful or something that, you know, that we didn't, we didn't like, she loses it for five or seven days or something. And, you know, that's one of the, <laughs> That's one of the things that's pretty big for a 10, you know, 12 year old is, yeah, you know, man, yeah. if I don't have my phone, then I got to tell my friends why I did, you know, what did I did to not have my phone. So, but we are very strict about it and I don't plan to, you know, I mean, I see all these kids at a very young age, like people, kids in between 12 and 16 can't even drive that are on Instagram uh, or TikTok or just the things that you could, the rabbit hole you can get yourself into in these things is not worth um, having to explain things to your kids. Um, you know, whether it be violence or, you know, pornography or whatever, it's, it's something that really, uh, I just want to be the one to, to, help my daughters be the best people they can be. And right now that's not having social media. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. And we've actually started doing that with Kenzie. We took her social media away because I started realizing how fast she was growing up. And I did fall into the trap where all of her friends are doing it. So it's okay. She needs to be like everyone else. And probably like the past six months, I started putting more restrictions on her. I actually deleted her Instagram, TikTok, yeah. Twitter, or not Twitter, Facebook, all of that stuff. Cause I realized it, it wasn't the right time, like you said. They're not old enough to be on that. Well, even if you're not, even if you're you're using it in an innocent manner, the just the time suck that it is. I think I saw something you said. If you got time to be on TikTok for thirty minutes, yeah. and you, you need to reprioritize yeah. your timing or something you like have that. Time to work out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you can go do that. I mean, and uh, and I've fallen into that too, because especially being in politics, I mean, uh, we have stuff that's posted about us and for us and different things like that, and you can you can spend a lot of time wondering what other people think that doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, it's like a rabbit hole. I yeah. mean, you, yeah. you end up going in it, and next thing you know, you look up. I, I catch myself sometimes on TikTok or on Instagram, uh, scrolling through and then an hour passes by. Yep. I'm like, what the heck, where'd the time go? Yeah. Um, and just to kind of move, cause times have changed, right? With technology, uh, different things that have come out. You're, when you were younger, your father obviously didn't have to deal with the amount of social media, the amount of internet. No, we, we didn't even have, Facebook came out when I was in college. Yeah. I think 2004 is when Facebook came out. And it was very new at the time. You had to have an email address from your college to get on Facebook. It wasn't open to everybody. You had to be a college student. Yeah. It yeah. was all Ivy League too, right? Mm -hmm. At first. Started out, yeah. yeah. 
at Harvard, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And so with, what are some tips? I know your, your father, when you were a kid, really didn't have to go through this. What are some tips that your father taught you growing up? Different things that your father did for you yeah. that you now use for your kids? Well, a couple of things. One, uh, I remember him being a really hard worker, you know, like that. I, he, he, he taught me the value of work ethic and he didn't allow me to, I mean, I was very blessed, but we grew up, well, I grew up fairly poor until there was a point when my dad started doing fairly well at real estate. So, I mean, most of my life up until maybe middle of high school, you know, we, we did not, you know, we weren't, you know, we had clothes and shoes, but it wasn't a bunch of disposable income going to vacations and whatnot. It, we would, we might go to South Padre or North Padre Island and to the yeah. beach or whatever and stay a weekend and so, you know, uh, they, they always gave me, I'm an only child, they gave me opportunities, but we didn't, you know, so I just saw how hard he worked to get to where he was. But probably the biggest thing, you know, that I can, that I can equate that, you know, for specifically fathers of daughters, but fathers of sons as well, is that just tell your kids you love them all the time. Like if you didn't, if, if there's so many people that, that didn't ever hear that from a parent, I, I had that, you know I mean? So when he passed away at the age of 48, of pancreatic cancer, I was 27 and we left it all out on the table. Like I, I knew where he stood and where I stood. And it was just, I say, tell your work hard and tell your kids you love them all the time. Cause you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Yeah. I, and I, uh, I couldn't imagine losing my dad at the age I am now, because yeah. I have still have so much to learn, yeah. and I lean on him so much, so I couldn't imagine being 27, um, yeah. trying to figure out life <laughs> without the number one guy in your life. I'm so. telling you, it is, it, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, and, and you know, somebody asked me that before, what, and that's not one of your questions, but what is the hardest thing you ever had to do? And it's learn to be a man with no but with no dad, you know, because that's who I would call and ask the question to. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, there's lots of men, like my, my dad, for instance, he lost his dad at 15. Mm. Um, so he never really had that father figure with him. So talking to those men that grew up without a father, do you have any advice for them that you could maybe give them to help? Well, you know, uh, like my Uncle Rod has been a great surrogate for, you know, he he and I are more like brothers than we are. He was my dad's younger brother. Uh, and, and and I could say also for other men that are maybe watching this, step up, step up into the gap. If you see somebody that needs that, that you, I know they need it. You, you can't, you can't get by on your own just trying to figure it out as a 15 year old or even a 25 or 27 year old um but you know uh, rod really stepped in as a brother and a father figure my father-in-law james hicks uh neely's dad so had a great support system really but if somebody is growing up without a dad they definitely need a mentor and they need somebody that's with them and that kind of walks them through because those are your most formative years you know I would say even 18 to 25, like you still need somebody to be able to call all the time. And so if you can ever step into the gap for somebody like that, that's huge. Cause I've, I had that. I, I mean, I, like I said, I've, I've been very blessed about having people that would step up when you needed help. Cause you just, sometimes you don't have anybody to call and you need an answer. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's one of the toughest things that I see, you know, men go through as far as with me, not always having to fill. So my, just a little backstory, my dad worked in the oil field um for 10 plus years for basically until i was 10 till i turned 18 and so i didn't always get to have the father figure there and so i had to lean on to other people and when you when you're looking for those mentors and i'm sure you have mentors of your own what are things that you look for when you're like okay this is someone that i Sure. No, well, um, one of the things that somebody told me uh, that stuck early was your mentor doesn't have to be one person because there can be somebody that's really good at business, but they're not that good at family. There's somebody that's really good at family, but maybe they're not at the level of the career that you want to be. And that's perfectly fine. So find different people for different aspects of your life. I mean, I would say starting, you know, I learned, um, you know, I met Larry Parks, uh, another one of my mentors at a men's Bible study. 
a Robert Lewis Bible study called Quest for Authentic Manhood. And I was about 23 or four years old when I, whenever I started going to that. So I went to a Bible study for men and I met men there. And some of those people have been some of my spiritual mentors or I've learned or met new people through them. Um, having businessmen that are really smart in your life, you know, Gus, your dad, Mark Andrews. I have people, you know, D Jimmy Dale. I've got people in my life that I can really, really, um, that have taught me a lot. Uh, Brian Berry and I sit through a lot of uh, real estate discussions and, you know, we've made more deals on the back of, you know, bar napkins than anything. I mean, I mean, we, we can, without doing a spreadsheet, we can get, make it happen, you know, on a calculator and I could go on and on because I've got a great set of friends, but pick the people that you see that are good at what they do. And, you know, sometimes you might have to pay for that. I mean, if somebody's really good at what they do, you might offer to pay for their time because some, I know I, as I grew up, I was younger wanting to always go co have coffee with people. Well, once you get to be a little older, you know, you can let, and we'll talk about this in a little bit with, uh, other stuff, but you know, you got to have control of your own calendar too. So you have to balance that. But, um, I think having other men that are good at what, you want to be good at and just asking them if you can have a little bit of their time. You buy the lunch, you buy the cup of coffee, you tell them it's 30 minutes. I, it's full stop, hard stop in 30 minutes. I, you know, I just need a little bit of your time. Um, most men are willing to do that. Um, so I think that you can find four different aspects of life. You can find somebody that maybe you want to get involved in politics. Maybe you want to get involved in your church. Maybe you want to be a better dad or husband, you know, uh, maybe you, you know, want to get better at golf, you know, yeah. find those people that are good at those things and, you know, imitate their actions. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I'm, luckily I'm blessed enough to have people like you, Gus, my father, Mike, um, I got a full circle around me of guys who are great businessmen and great dads, um, people of faith. Like So definitely I'm blessed to grow up yeah. around a, such a big group and crowd that I can lean on. Even if I didn't have those conversations with them, I was around them enough to see what they do and how they act. So that was a huge advantage. Yeah, you're, somebody's always watching. I learned that too. Uh, you can make you can make that mistake as a young buck by doing kind of what the crowd does and the rest of the world does, and then, you know, I mean, I've had it. Like I said, I don't get it all right. I have people that will come and say, "Hey, you know, even even at almost forty years old, you ever think about maybe not saying it that way, <laughs> <laughs> or or maybe not putting that on Twitter, or maybe not, you know? I mean, because uh, and uh, we're all, we're constantly learning. We're humans, and we make mistakes and. Uh, that's another thing you can teach your children is own up to, you know, have some personal responsibility and own, own up to your, you know, own up to your actions and just say, I did that. I'm sorry. It was stupid. How do we, how do we go forward from here? Cause you're going to make some mistakes as a young man. Yeah. yeah. Now I think one of your best traits you can have as a person is self-awareness and emotional intelligence. If you have those two, you can get a, go a long way in your life. Yeah. Um, there's nothing worse than doing something wrong and having no idea you messed up. Yeah. Until someone has to remind you or show you. And you want people in your life that'll say something to you about it. Kind of keep you, keep you grounded and keep your, you know, keep your head from getting too big sometimes too. Cause you do start to have a little success and you do start to, you know, things start to click a little bit and you just need to remember that you put your pants on just like everybody else and you're not better than anybody else. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes that, you know, if you're a confident person, uh, that can come off as cocky or arrogant. So I, that's one of my main struggles is trying to sandpaper off my confidence to where it comes off as, you know, humility, which is mm -hmm. hard to do if you're in the business that I'm in, you know, especially in politics, you know, we have people that are gunning for your jugular at all times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you don't feel like you did anything to deserve that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. I get that. I, I, uh, just ever since we started this podcast and YouTube, we get comments and stuff. I couldn't even imagine the stuff you see, but it's like people just say whatever they want. Yeah, try try not try not to read it, but sometimes it's yeah. unavoidable because, especially in these campaign season we're going through right now, there's a lot. Of, and I jokingly say this, but a lot of my friends don't know that I also have a phone, also have a mailbox, also have YouTube. Yeah. I see I see it. <laughs> I got the same one in the mail you did. I got the yeah. same text you did. <laughs> you know, but yeah, people are. Uh, uh, people are uh, angry and, and mean sometimes. Yeah, and I'm mean, kind of going off the same subject. Since you have been a successful entrepreneur, successful politician, father, uh, what would you say in your professional career is your biggest accomplishment so far? 
Well, professional career, I would say um, I've had the opportunity to be um, a part of this community in in multi you know a multifaceted way. I've served in boards and commissions. I've served on the city council. I've uh, Leighton and I have tried really hard to build a company with good culture and core values. We had 22 agents when I started uh, in 2014, when we started in 2014 uh, as owners, and we have about 230 now. We want to be at 300 by the end of the year and 500 in three years and 2010 years. We have plans to get there. And so uh, I'd say one of the biggest accomplishments is is just building a company that started as uh, a mom and pop real estate shop and it was very successful they built a great reputation for us and we took that baton and ran with it and made it a legitimate business operation not that they weren't legitimate i'm just saying we uh my dad and his business partner probably never dreamed of being 200 plus <laughs> agents you know yeah. uh they were they were good at what they did and it was run a little bit different way um but you know being able to juggle the legislature and, you know, the great team that we've put together here uh, at Regal, uh, I, I consider that to be a great accomplishment because, you know, it doesn't leave for, for much extra time. Yeah. yeah, how do you plan for that with the work-life balance with the family, uh, having to leave for Austin and run a business? Well, for one, Neely is great. I mean, I would not be able to do it without Neely. Uh, Layton and Melanie and the team here are really good on the business side when I'm in Austin, but um, I have people ask me, they're thinking about running for office, and I'm like, if your spouse is not fully in, I don't mean like 50%, 75%, 80%, they have to be full on in on what you're about to do, I would not do it. Because I've seen guys and, and ladies down there that they don't have the support back at home, and it's miserable. It's miserable sometimes anyways, uh, spending 240 days in Austin whenever you, you know, uh, we have policy disagreements or, or uh, we have different things that pop up. But, um, you know, I would say, yeah, you got to have uh, a spouse at home that really, really has your back. I have a great support system here at the office. They allow me to have that flexibility to go to Austin. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been really rewarding to be able to give back to the community that, that I grew up in. That's yeah. awesome. And yeah. definitely not on uh, the high level like you. But that's funny that you say that because I talk to, I guess, other racing wives mm -hmm. and husbands. And I tell them, hey, if your wife's not all the way bought in, there's no way you can do it. I mean, I've gone not near as much as 240 days a year, but on the road, 30 weekends out of the year, 40 weekends. And so it, it, if the wife is at home and not supporting it, yeah, it's miserable. Well, it, it really is. One of the things, you, something's got to give. And uh, I'll say two things about this. Um, Steve, Steve Stroop, who's another mentor of mine, gave me a book um, called Free to Focus by Michael Hyde. It's a really good book, but it teaches you in a nutshell um, how to build your calendar around the things that are most important. And so if you do that first and you treat those like flexible doctor's appointments, it doesn't have to be like you do it exactly. Schedule time with yourself. Don't let people control your calendar. Um, schedule appointments with yourself and do those things. And so one of the things that I started implementing is um, and, and we can't, we don't always hit it, but if, if Sundays are a family time and a, and a time of rest, put that on your calendar as family time and rest time. Yeah. You know, uh, if you want to eat dinner three or four nights a week at the table with your kids, put it on your calendar and do it. If somebody says, can you do this thing on Saturday or can you do this thing on Wednesday night? You look at, we got dinner at home. No, you can't. I mean, if you want to go to a restaurant with your family or something, but I like, I try to put the things that are the most important. If you want to read your Bible from, you know, 6.30 to 7.30 in the morning or read a book or sit down and just be quiet, put it on your calendar. And uh, Michael Hyatt really uh, hit it and free to focus about freeing up your time, do the things that charge you up. Uh, recharge yourself before you start going in and trying to recharge other people because you will get into a rut. Happened to me back in probably June of last year uh, after the session. My mom had just passed away and I was doing nothing for myself time-wise. And uh, and uh, you're, you're like a teapot. Eventually it's going to whistle and scream and our bodies aren't meant not to have rest and sleep and healthy diets and you know exercise. And I, I definitely don't get that right all the time, but if you put it on your calendar, you know, that's one step towards getting it done. Yeah. What would you say your biggest factor is like 
So for me, I hate telling people no, mm -hmm. and I've had to learn how to do it um, in the past year or two. What was the biggest it factor for like allowing yourself to tell people no and not feeling bad or you, you, letting people down? You need to disappoint the right people. Okay. You disappoint the right people. Think about the people in your life that you don't want to disappoint. I don't want to disappoint Cam. I don't want to disappoint my kids. I don't want to disappoint my dad. I don't want to disappoint my business partners or, or a friend that I have, you know, a, a side business with. Uh, don't disappoint those people. Like prioritize the people that, you know, uh, because it, it never stops. There's always somebody that wants to go to coffee with you, pick your brain, take you to lunch, take, invite you on a trip. Um, and you know, if, if somebody is going to be mad at you for prioritizing something that is m more important to you in your life, and typically you can prove that. You know, typically you can say, "I'm sorry, my daughter's birthday is on uh, next Tuesday, and we're taking her to dinner for her birthday with a couple of friends." But it's like, well, you don't understand, Justin. This is the X Y Z banquet. Like, you yeah. got to be there. Like, <laughs> how are you? You're telling me you're not going to this banquet on Tuesday? No, I'm not. I'm not because it's my daughter's 12th birthday. Uh, so you just got to have hard and fast rules. Make rules and policies for yourself. Prioritize the right things in your calendar and disappoint the right people. I like that. That's actually really good advice. Thanks. Yeah. No. I'm, yeah. That, that was my question that I was gonna ask him is uh, to get that done. Um, and. As you've grown as a, just to kind of uh, switch a little bit, as you've grown and you've looked at people, who, who is someone, you've mentioned a whole bunch of mentors, looking back, who is one of the first people that you've kind of looked up to um, when? when I, yeah, I mentioned a lot of people, but there's one I haven't mentioned yet, uh, and he probably wouldn't even know that I was saying this, but a colleague of mine who is a state rep for Forney, Keith Bell, uh, he came in a session after me. He has two daughters that are grown that are closer to my age. They're probably closer to your age, but, you know, he's in that 60s, you know, low 60s age um, and very successful electrical contracting business. One of the utmost moral and ethical men you'll ever meet. Served his community on the school board for 20 years. Been an elder and a deacon at his church. You, be, you can look at somebody's family and see how good of a dad and granddad they are. And uh, uh, I have learned so much about fatherhood and marriage and just the way that you treat people and the way that you say things and do things. And, um, you know, consequently, I've been able to help with at least one more session of things that, you know, so we kind of feed off of each other. We live so close to each other that... Uh, we live about 12 miles apart because he's in Kaufman County and I'm in Rockwall County. Yeah. And so we'll ride to Austin back and forth. And the, the conversations that we've had, I mean, you would pay for the advice that he's able to give me just, just based off the life experience. So I would say uh, of the men that, you know, if you pick a person you want to emulate and have a good husband, good daughters, good grandkids, successful business, that's Keith Bell for me. Okay. You kind of mentioned it on there. I'll pay for it if I need to. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you buy the gas on the way to Austin? <laughs> usually, usually we take my truck, but I let him drive because he, he drives a little faster than I do. But So I, I, I actually just ride and listen, <laughs> and he likes to drive, so it's fun. Have they finally fixed the construction in Waco? It's not bad, yeah. No, it's, it's, there's, some, there's some construction a little bit in, uh, you know, before you get to Waxahachie, but it, I mean, we can get to Austin in three hours from our from our house yeah it's not bad at all well looking around here in your office it seems like you have a bunch of hobbies what what, what would you say your favorite hobby is golf yeah yeah uh, yeah over yeah over hunting i grew up i started my cousin robert and i uh grew up duck hunting when we were like probably 12 and 13 years old and uh we actually used to just get all dressed up and walk from his house or our grandparents house to the pond so i, I always loved duck hunting but it's one of those things that I had to give something up whenever I started doing all these other things, um, and it was fishing and hunting, which I still love to do. I love to saltwater fish. Neely and I do that almost every trip or vacation we go on. We'll go saltwater fishing in a different way, like either offshore or inshore on a flat boat. Um, so we love fishing together. Um, and I have a bird dog named Bo who, uh, who has a few hunts in his belt, under his belt now, and I love to duck hunt. But those are few and far between now. But I'm able to get out on the golf course because of, a, you know, whenever I'm not in Austin, I have a pretty flexible schedule here. So, um, and a lot of buddies that play it. So um, golf is the most 
frustrating game in the world that you just want to keep going and playing you know <laughs> yeah you get one good shot and you're like oh i can do that again <laughs> that's why i'm coming back but yeah it's i've definitely lost a club or two who's the best golfer out of all of y'all's friends oh gosh jack nottingham Really? Probably. So, oh man, th there's going to be some guys that get pissed off. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not Gus. Um, yeah, Gus is good. He got good. I, I remember when I first started hanging out with Gus several, you know, 10 or 12 or 15 years ago, he didn't play. And he was just like, I don't have time to do that. And then all of a sudden he got clubs and he got better than everybody. And like, I've stayed the same the whole time. Um, but I'd, I'd say uh, of my closest friends, Jack Nottingham, he carries about a one or a zero. Oh, wow. Yeah. Are we gonna get another golf tournament out of Regal? Uh, yeah, we're gonna. I actually, I actually thought about that. Uh, maybe if in April or May this year we can do a, a spouses tournament again. That was always fun. Um, that was a blast. I yeah, know. Sulphur Springs Country Club is one of my favorite places to play, and I can get on the phone and make three phone calls and be in Sulphur Springs in like 55 minutes, and you're there, and it's beautiful out there. It's a little hidden diamond in the rough in East Texas. That's oh, wow. awesome. Yeah. Well, we uh, we appreciate you taking the time with us today, Justin. Yeah. I, you know, I always love seeing you. Um, I truly do love you and your family, thank and we uh, wish the best guys. for you. So. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, man. It was nice talking to you. Uh, I hope that we can do this again. I can talk to you, and you know, me personally, I'm I'm only 23. I'm still just trying to learn my way through life uh, with my fiance now, and. Hopefully when I have kids. So. Well, for 23 and 27, you guys are doing something right. You can tell. There's a lot of guys that aren't trying to figure out how to be better men right now. So, <laughs> Luckily, I have a father who would put me in check real fast. Yes, so. And about eight other He's men around me. me before. <laughs> <laughs> so, but like always, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate you. Go ahead and give us a follow and share this video. And we'll see you next time.